Nice to meet you again, sir. <laughs> nice to meet you, Sean. Could you please introduce yourself briefly? So I am uh, Kun van der Entergem. So where were you born? I was born in, a, I think, maybe the most beautiful city in Belgium, which is Bruges, which is a historical, medieval, small mm -hmm. city, mm -hmm. very, wow. very close to the North mm -hmm. Sea. Mm -hmm. So you attended your elementary school and middle school and high school there? Uh, elementary and high school, yes, university in Leuven, which is, I would say, maybe uh, well, it's the oldest university of Belgium. When did you decide to go to the medical school? We had at that time a very nice program on television, mm -hmm. which was all creatures, I think small and great or something, and it was on a veterinary. So this was such a nice program. It was, it was a veterinarian who was helping farmers with their cows, with ah. their horses, and then I was thinking maybe I should become a veterinarian. Mm -hmm. So I had already interest in medical profession. Something else is when I was younger, mm -hmm. I uh, was asked, do you want something for your Santa Claus? Mm -hmm. I usually asked for anatomy books. So ah. the human body, mm -hmm. scientifically spoken then, wow. always interested me. So this is something else that might have helped me in my decision. And there's something else also, our neighbor was also a veterinarian, uh, but not treating the big animals, but the small animals, the, the, the dogs, the cats. Mm -hmm. And I used to help him. Uh, and we did surgery together, so I helped him <laughs> operating on dogs. When there was, for example, a dog who had a miscarriage, he gave me the fetus and uh, I got the fetus to my home and wow. I put it in a container. So, uh, with the formaldehyde, mm -hmm. so I had this in my room. So my oh. mother was very happy because I had all kinds of funny things. So I have always been attracted in anatomy, etc. But then at my puberty, in the uh, high school, we learned about authors of books, such as John Steinbeck, English books. Mm. And at that time, there has been a short period that I was thinking, maybe I should do something with languages, mm -hmm. because I like culture also very much. So, and then um, at the end of my uh, high school, I had to take a decision and I came back to my first love, which was medicine. Mm. So I started medical school, but it has been already, let's say, a dream when I was young because my father was an engineer, mm -hmm. my mother was taking care of the children. Mm -hmm. So there were no doctors in my family. It's not that I have had an example. Mm -hmm. It was something that, let's say, I had uh, a dream of mine oh. for a very long time. Mm. So how was your medical school days? Were you a good student? Let's say I always passed the exams. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. I never had to do a re-exam in summer, mm -hmm. so I always passed from the first time, mm -hmm. which was for me very important. Mm -hmm. And this was a little bit my aim. So I said, okay, I want to have some fun. I want to be a student. I don't want to have re-exams, mm -hmm. but it does not need to be more than this. So if I succeed mm -hmm. and I have enough, more than 50%, it's okay with me. Mm -hmm. So this is how I started. Mm. And this is an honest answer. If I think back now, mm -hmm. then I think maybe I should have been a little bit more adult a little bit more serious and a little bit more focused on my studies, I would have had better results. I always had distinction, so I, I always had good points, but I changed completely later in life because boys, and this is especially true for me, <laughs> not really uh, very adult at that time, so I had a very nice time being a student. Mm -hmm. We had a lot of fun. I never had re-exams, mm -hmm. I had good points, but it could have been much better, I think. To be fair, I, during my medical school days, I was uh, barely, barely surviving. I did, did uh, several re-exams, you know, especially when I was studying the basic sciences. But when I uh, was starting to learn about the clinical stuff, then you I got interested. more interested. So especially the surgical parts like orthopedics or plastic surgeries, ophthalmology, it's, urology. It's more or less the same with me. 
but yeah. it came gradually. Mm -hmm. So, when did you decide to become a urologist and why? This was something that I tried also to come to a logic conclusion because I thought a lot about it. Mm -hmm. One thing was for sure, I wanted to be a surgeon. All right. But which surgery, I didn't know. So I started to think about orthopedics, plastic surgeon, abdominal, thoracic, urology. It was not that difficult to come to the final conclusion that urology was the most beautiful surgical discipline there is. We mm. have a lot of mm. diagnostics that we do ourselves, ultrasound, biopsy, mm. cystoscopy. Mm. We see female patients, mm. we see male patients, mm. we see children. We do big surgery, mm -hmm. cystectomy, mm. prostatectomy, uh, nephrectomy. We do small surgery, we do plastic surgery, uh, hypospadias. Mm -hmm. uh, we did everything, mm. but I will explain later. Being a urologist, you start to focus on a certain mm. field. But in the beginning, I liked it because we did so many different things. Mm. And I'm still convinced that urology is a very complete mm. discipline of surgery. So one of the things I heard from my seniors, I'll, I'll say my brothers in my field, they said they love urology because we see the patient from the beginning yep. to till the end. Let's say diagnosis and treatment and follow-ups. Everything we do on our own. We do not have to rely on other department of the medicine guys that they will decide what we should do. No, we decide it by ourselves. And there's another thing, Sean, that is important. Urologists are great people. <laughs> and this yes, is true. Yes, very true. It's a family. Mm. We, we are all together and we have the same spirit. Yes. Okay. So. When did you decide to go to the uh, men's health, you know, specialist and why? I like this question because this is, it's a nice story, Sean. So I explained I started in 1993 and we were two urologists, my older colleague mm -hmm. and me. And he said in the beginning, okay, you will do impotence mm -hmm. and I will do all the rest. What do you think? Good deal, huh? <laughs> <laughs> well, I was young, so I had to accept because this was the beginning of my job. So I said, okay, I do impotence. Mm -hmm. 1993, what were the available treatments for erectile dysfunction? We had no pills. No pills. No pills. We had injection, mm -hmm. yes. Yes. And we had penile implant, which was not as common as, as it is now. Mm -hmm. So I said to, the, to my colleague, okay, I will do impo impotence. And I said to him, but if you want me to do this, I will do this, but it will be state of the art, it will be high quality care. Right. I will try to be the best in the field. I want to go for the top. And uh, of course, at that time, I told you what the av available treatments were. Mm -hmm. After a couple of months, I said to my colleague, this doesn't work because mm -hmm. I only see a few patients. Mm -hmm. I said, no, we make another deal. We do both everything, mm -hmm. but I will do impotence and you will do the pediatric urology because he was specially trained in this. Mm -hmm. So this was the beginning of my career. I did everything, but with a focus on andrology on man's oh. health. And this became, so I started, I did my first penile implant already in 1993. And there's an anecdote because uh, my first implant in 1993, this was recorded for a Belgian television program, which was very popular. <laughs> So my first, my first implant was with a camera. <laughs> There's another joke because the guy, the journalist who made the program, he's very popular. He's the Clint Eastwood, mm, so he's mm, the, mm. The, the strong guy, mm, the macho. Mm, mm, mm. And this guy came to film this operation. Right. He fainted. He fainted? <laughs> he fainted, yeah, during the operation. <laughs> So anyway, this was my first penile implant with Belgian television in oh. the OR. And then I uh, kept on doing it because I liked it, but I wanted to be a high quality surgeon. Mm. And at a certain time I was thinking, okay, I focus more and more on man's health. I want to make this really not only erectile dysfunction, and I started with an aging male clinic, which means that male patients from a certain age, let's say 40 years old, they become older and they might be confronted with different conditions. And I divided this in four different fields, mm -hmm. BPH, mm -hmm. prostate cancer, mm -hmm. late onset 
hypogonadism mm -hmm. and erectile dysfunction. But this was 2004, what I'm talking wow. about. And I said, but we need to interact with the cardiologist or collaborate with the endocrinologist, mm -hmm. with the sexologist, mm -hmm. because, mm -hmm. for example, erectile dysfunction is not a disease, it's a symptom. Mm. So this might be a patient with low testosterone. Mm. This might be a patient with an unknown diabetes. Or a patient with an erectile dysfunction might have at the same time prostatic problems. Mm. So we did the holistic approach and this was a very big success. Mm -hmm. I have a very nice story about this. So I started uh, with this aging male clinic. Mm -hmm with the cardiologist and also with the general practitioner because mm. I thought the patient should come to the GP mm -hmm. and then the GP should control cholesterol, glucose, testosterone, PSA, etc. and then refer, if necessary, the patient. And the hospital was very happy with the initiative, so I, the preparation of this initiative took one year. I had a magnificent website, the Aging Male mm. Clinic website, and uh, the hospital arranged so. a press conference. And this was Friday evening. We have two main channels on Belgian television. This was prime time wow. in the news. So there was a big boom. Wow. What happened? People read it, saw it on television, heard it on the radio. And there were two strange effects. One was there were so many people that wanted to come as a patient mm -hmm. to the aging male clinic mm -hmm. that at noon on Saturday, I got a phone call from the dispatching from the hospital. They said, mm -hmm. doctor, we have a big problem. There are so many patients calling the hospital. Our telephone system is crashing. Ah. We are unreachable <laughs> because of this. So this was an enormous success. I, I had, for example, uh, one thing I remember, there was a mother mm -hmm. and she had four sons and she called and she said, I'm a mother, I have four sons, I want to make an appointment for my four sons at the same time. <laughs> there was another guy, there was another guy, he was an anesthesiologist mm -hmm. in Karolinska in Stockholm in Sweden. Mm -hmm. He heard about this clinic, so he wow. made an appointment, so he came from Sweden wow. just to see me. So, but the other thing, Sean, All right. is very interesting lesson. Mm -hmm. There was a big reaction also from the doctors when they heard this and what happened. So everybody wanted to have an appointment, but the GPs, the urologists in Belgium, they all heard about this new clinic and they became very afraid. They were thinking, oh my God, this guy is going to have all male patients in Belgium. And what was the funny thing? So as I told you, I involved GPs in establishing this aging male clinic. And one of the, the, the two GPs that were involved, you know what they did? They said, my God, this is interesting. I might get a lot of money out of this project. So what I will do, I will not, as we agreed upon, I will not discuss with my colleague GPs. I keep this as a secret for me. Once it starts, I will be the big guy. I will earn a lot of money. So all the GPs said, what is happening? We never heard of this because this, GP guys, they didn't communicate with their colleagues. colleagues. And the urologists, the, they were so scared. You know what they did? They started a website, protest against aging male clinic. <laughs> and I can tell you, it was for me frightening because there was in the beginning, so there was a huge response. So many patients wanted to be a patient in this aging male clinic because you know the guidelines. What is in the guidelines now? If you have a patient with erectile dysfunction, you should see is there diabetes, mm. is there hypertension. But at that time, this was not normal practice. So I did something that was a little bit before. So this was huge. And then there was on television, a uh, big fight in urology world in Belgium. Uh, urologists protest against aging male clinic. So it was first heaven, then it was hell. And my wife is, she's a, she's a judge. Mm -hmm. So I have a lot of ah. relations in, the, in the, this world, in the legal world. And um, I contacted a few lawyers and they said, okay, you know, if the dogs bark, just let them bark. Mm. But the caravan 
moves on. Mm. So I didn't react to all those reactions and in the end it stopped. But I can tell you it was frightening because there was a lot of aggression against me. But I learned that, for example, even if you have a good ID and you, have, you want to treat your colleagues well, well, they might become nasty. And uh, my conclusion was then, okay guys, so if you want to play it like this, one, I will not react to all the garbage that you gave in interviews, in newspapers, on the radio, on television. And my second lesson was, I will start with a PhD. And I can tell you, I worked like hell. And after three years, mm -hmm. I had my public defense and I had my PhD. Mm. So this, is, this was my motivation to say, I will answer you with science. Uh, I mean, just like the English saying, you know, idiom. What doesn't kill you make you stronger. Because yeah. Yeah. Well, for me, a similar thing happened. When I became successful with the prosthetic surgeries in my country, everybody became uh, you know, jealousy and the anger and all those nasty attacks. Yeah. I didn't know what to do. At first I thought it was a, some kind of curse. I had the same uh, issues with me, but those adversities kind of uh, helped me grow mature, more mature. So at first I want to fight against them, uh, like you said, but uh, and on second thought, why should I? No. But fighting with them will never solve the problem. Uh, like you, what I did was, well, I want to get trained myself better. So I went to the uh, other countries to That's learn. That's what I did. Yes. This is what you should do. Yeah. So if you fight, you lose a lot of energy. There's a saying in uh, Dutch, and maybe you know this. So if you're a high tree, you get a lot of wind and you have to accept this. Where, where did you get your fellowship on the prosthetic urology? Well, I did my training in Leuven, which is the, is the biggest urology department in Belgium. They didn't do prosthetics there. And then I did part of my training in the Radboud, Nijmegen, the Netherlands, which was at that time with Professor De Bruyne, Frans De Bruyne, who is the founder of the EAU. Oh. In my opinion, this was maybe the best department of urology at that time in Europe. Mm. It was outstanding. There was so much activity. Mm. And there were, I did uh, for uh, three or four months mm -hmm. prosthetics with mm. Erik Muleman. Mm -hmm. mm. So uh, when I started in 1993, my colleague said, you do impotence. I said, okay, yeah. Huh? I think 1994, there was a meeting in Brussels and it was also on prosthetics and Steve was invited. Ah. And of course, I knew Steve by name because he, uh, you know, Steve, he, he was, he is, yeah, he, he, he was and is the biggest. So I was there as a very young urologist and I was interested in penile implants. During the coffee pause, I talked with Steve and he said, you know what, Kun, come on, join me in theater. We do the surgery together. <laughs> so this was for me, this is, he doesn't remember, of course, because he did this thousands of times. Sure. But for me, being a young beginning urologist, starting prosthetics, and then the big Pope mm -hmm. said, you want to join me in theater? I said, well, of course I want to join you. And you know what he always does? And uh, he gave me a diploma and this is in my office oh. still now. And then you have to know that at that time there were high volume implant surgeons. Yeah, you had in the US. Mm -hmm. So, and in Europe, you didn't really have many people doing this. Mm -hmm. Maybe in London, UCLA, but, yeah, but not at that time, 1993. Oh. So if you ask me about my fellowship, well, it was, uh, I was happy to be in Nijmegen where they did it, which was not that uh, common at that time. And then I have this magnificent experience in Brussels with Steve. And then, well, then you, you start and you, you do a lot. You have to learn on yourself, you know, Sean. Mm, yes, very correct.